Welcome to the Freedom of Expression Summit 2020, brought to you by ICNL and Chapter 4 Uganda. Today on the summit, um, allow me to introduce my panelists and then I'll let you know in on exactly what we're going to talk about. Beginning on my extreme left, I have Dr. Emily Comfort. She's the head and senior lecturer Department of Journalism and Media Studies, Uganda Christian University. Good to have you today. Thank you, Kanare. And on my immediate left, I have Catherine Anite, founding director, Freedom of Expression Hub, and member of the Advisory Council, International Center for Non-for-Profit, Not-for-Profit Law. And also, she's a member of the high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom. Good to have you today. Thank you, Canary. Now, we all recognize the overriding importance of freedom of expression as a human right. And it's been widely recognized as an essential underpinning of democracy and means of safeguarding other human rights. So in essence, uh, the enjoyment of other fundamental human rights is adversely um, affected if the masses are denied the right to freely express their own opinions. And even if theirs are divergent views to what the majority or what the government really does not accept, that becomes a problem. It is therefore pertinent to appreciate that the free flow of information and ideas lie at the heart of every notion of democracy and is crucial for effective respect for human rights. And now that we're going into the scientific campaigns or digital campaigns uh, that will eventually lead us into the 2021 general election, it is important that such a conversation is held now. Let me begin with you, um, Doctor. What's, what's your own general perspective on the general state of freedom of expression in Uganda? And as you conclude your remarks on that, what does it mean for the digital campaigns ahead of the 2021 general election that is forthcoming? Thank you, Kanari. Uh, that's a very broad question uh, to ask about the status of uh, freedom of expression in Uganda. Uh, most times for us in the media, we are more concerned about uh, freedom of the press and of the media in general. But uh, we are also concerned about freedom of expression. Uh, freedom of expression means that uh, we are talking about not just freedom of the media, but also of organizing, of assembly, of, uh, of, of generally expressing yourself using any platform. And so in, in order for us to evaluate whether we have a, a good status of uh, freedom of expression or not, we must see that all of these elements are actually working together. In most cases, we pull out one element and say, okay, the media is free because they, they are allowed. When people are able to say whatever nonsense they can say on the media, we take it as a sign that there is a freedom of expression. But that is far from it. Uh, in my own assessment, I think that uh, we've had a mixed bag. There's a certain degree of, um, of uh, freedom of expression in the sense that before COVID, at least, we were allowed to go to church. We could, uh, you know, belong to political parties. We could organize in some forms. We could do many of these other things that are provided for in the Constitution. But uh, there are several limitations to that. Uh, most people will say that they are not very free to express themselves. They are not very free to belong to certain political parties. They are not very free to... Um, that they are not very free to... To, to generally be who they are. There, yeah. there are certain things, there are certain no-go zone areas that you just know as a person that I cannot overstep that boundary. And people who have overstepped them have actually uh, been punished in one way or another. I can give examples, uh, maybe I will not go to, there, to that yet. But at least in general terms, it's mixed. There are areas where you can have freedom, there are areas where you, you can not have freedom. And the areas where there are extreme limitations are actually that of political organizing. It might seem like uh, we have uh, provisions for people to belong, but they, as I said earlier, there are serious limitations for people to belong. And, and this is one area where, as we go to the campaigns, uh, you, you will see that there are people who, when they go out to, to, to organize, to collect, to, to sell their ideas to the electorate, they are stopped by the police. They, they may not be, they may be dispersed before they even actually sell their ideas. They may uh, be denied access to their venue. They may be pulled out of a radio station. Those are the kinds of limitations we are talking about that actually in, in impacts.
on freedom of expression. So one must look at it more holistically, not just because they can say things on the media, but also because they have those limitations in terms of organizing and other areas of uh, freedom. All right, so Catherine. But, okay. Sorry, the, the other question you asked is what it means for, uh, for, the, digital the, campaigns. for the digital campaigns. And, and I always say that campaigns have always been on media. Even before this, we have had um, campaigns on the media. But the difference now is that uh, other forms of campaign will be banned. And so majority of the people who would have accessed their, their uh, political actors through the usual ways of organizing will not be able to do that. So it means that the, the, the freedom of the media becomes of paramount importance for digital campaigns to actually happen. And uh, there are serious limitations in as far as that is concerned. I, I guess some of you who are in the media know that it's just not uh, possible for people to walk in and out of the media and say what they want. They have to be invited. You have to invite me here. I'm if sorry, you yeah. didn't, I would not come here to talk about this. So people have to be invited in most cases. Certain conversations happen within specific spaces, and that is guarded in most cases. So it, it, it presents a real challenge for how we are actually able to do a digital campaign that will benefit everyone. Uh, usually it would be the voter interfacing with the, the candidate, right? But now it's going to be through media. And we, it's, it's a good time we're talking about freedom of expression. So, Catherine, over to you. What would you say is the state, general state of freedom of expression in Uganda? And then later on, you'll have to give us your opinion on what this means for the digital campaigns. But I also want to think there's no law that exactly is guiding the digital campaigns, for example, what you are supposed to say and what you're not supposed to say when you're campaigning digitally, right? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Carnery. So my general outlook is uh, the, the space for freedom of expression is, is not only shrinking, it has closed. So a few years ago it was shrinking, but as of this year it's closing. And we see that there's a plethora of laws and policies that inhibit uh, expression in Uganda. So, for example, when we look at the Press and Journalists Act, um, it, uh, it has its onerous um, limitations on um, journalists who, you know, um, on, on how, can I, how can I say, on um, registration of journalists. So, we have what we call NIJU, the National Institute of Journalists uh, Union, which is non-existent. So that institute is mandated to register, to enroll journalists before um, they get a practicing certificate. So we don't have NIJU, but we have the Media Council that is supposed to give a practicing certificate. Yeah. So um, they may, I hear talks in the corridor that journalists may be registered, but you cannot, the state cannot register journalists when NIJU is non-existent. That, that's, that's quite interesting. You know why? Because um, I think me, early this year, um, the Media Council asked us to go and register, submitting all our CVs and, and everything, and then we get registered, rather academic documents. And they issued out cards that look like um, press cards, very small cards, and say those, that's, your, that's a license. Well, um, so you're saying that's illegal? Well, that, that procedure is flouted, really, because the first institute that is mandated to enroll is NIJU, and it's not in existence. So what uh, the Media Council is mandated to do is to give you a practicing certificate when you issue your enrollment certificate to them. So that onerous process of registration um, under the Press and Journalists Act is really um, inhibiting expression. So mm. you might have to sit as journalists to read the law before you engage in, um, in, 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 um, in applying it. So... Um, you should have known that before the media council issues you with a practicing certificate, you must be enrolled. So that process is, is flouted. What, what does that have to do with freedom of expression? So um, when you look at standards for registration of journalists across the world, um, international standards prescribe that you actually do not need academic documentation to qualify to practice journalism. But when you read the Press and Journalists Act, it um, it ensures that all journalists must have a degree in journalism to practice. And if you don't have a degree in journalism, you must have another um, diploma, but you must have practiced, I think, for about a two year, years. a year or two years. Yeah. 
but freedom of expression is a, is a human right. So you don't need academic documents. Yes, for a qualification you to, for you to practice. So if you're in the trade of journalism, all you need to do is to have ethical conducts and professional conducts at the back of your mind as you practice the trade. So besides the Press and Journalist Act, we do have other laws like the Uganda Communications Act and the bundle of, uh, of, of its uh, regulations that recently have been making headlines, um, the, the stage plays and um, the film and documentary regulations, the content yeah. regulations. We have the directives that came out last year um, that direct um, those like you who have a huge following yeah, I, I'm sure you have a huge following on social media and bloggers to register and pay a fee before you communicate online. And yet, this is my right exactly. to express myself. Okay. Exactly. So, so you, you talked about regulations, and that's why I want to come in. So the, the law provides for minimum broadcasting standards, right? The standards require broad, broad, broadcasts not to be contrary to public morality or promote the character of violence or create public insecurity or violence. What is your comment about these standards, and are they justifiable uh, limitations to press freedom or freedom of expression? Okay, uh, so I would like to respond to the previous question of uh, digital elections oh, yeah. and the law. Please. So um, the coronavirus has created um, challenges for everyone, including for the electoral um, for the electoral bodies. So because of social distancing, we are required to under the guidelines that. Uh, UCC has put out an electoral commission. We're going to have uh, what they call virtual elections. Um, but we've been seeing that these guidelines are not being applied equally. So we see NRM uh, politicians going to the electorate to campaign. We saw the Minister of uh, Health going to her electorate, and yet she's, um, she's the one telling us to social distance. We saw people like Mukula going to the electorate. And yet, when you see opposition figures doing the same, they are arrested. So the, the regulations are not being applied. Um, as they should be. So they are applied as, selectively. They are applied selectively. And yet, when you look at, um, uh, in 2020, I think that was March, the Constitutional Court um, nullified Section 8, 8 of the uh, Public Order Management Act, which was giving the police uh, overzealous powers to control assembly. And uh, the court actually noted that you know, that provision was enacted by parliament to stifle opposition. Mm. And we are seeing it during this time of um, the digital campaigns. Um, in addition, in July, I think UCC also put out guidelines um, to guide the media, the public, and uh, the candidates during the, uh, the digital elections. So you're supposed to tell us how much you're charging each candidate, you know, before they come to your, uh, to your station. Uh, we, the cost must be clear. Um, you must give all candidates um, fair and equitable time. But the question is, who owns the media? So imagine. Um, and, 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 and is it mandatory that you know, everyone should get equal, equal space on TV, even if it's a private television or private radio station? Yes, so that's what the UCC guidelines on media are saying. But again, if you read. Um, the election amendments, uh, laws of 2020, the presidential election uh, amendment and... The parliamentary one. Exactly. It says, um, it takes into uh, consideration what the Supreme Court said during the Mama and Babazi case, um, the election petition of 2016, that the government should amend um, its laws within two years, but it has taken five years. So that means uh, the state did not listen to the Supreme Court. So. This year, the government has, uh, um, has listened to the Supreme Court and has directed the Electoral Commission to provide equitable time to all candidates who are going to state media, that is UBC. But um, in terms of application, I don't know if that's going to be possible mm. because what is state media and who owns the state, state media? media. Uh, the politicians may pay their money to access the state media, but they may be stopped or blocked from accessing, as we've seen in the previous in the years. Previous, yeah. um, so, we, so it's going to be quite a trick one. So, so then let, let's talk about the minimum broadcasting standards. Uh, are, are they just fair limitations to press freedom 
and freedom of expressions? Uh, my response to that is they are not. They, they are uh, restrictive. They are not justifiable at all in a democratic dispensation. So when you look at, um, I think it's Schedule 4 of the Uganda Communications Act, which speaks to uh, the minimum broadcasting standards. Um, they are vague, ambiguous, imprecise. So if we expect journalists to understand the vagueness in, in the minimum broadcasting standards. I think that's, that's the main cause why there is a, a regulatory overreach by UCC. Because their laws alone are vague. I don't, I don't actually think they, they understand uh, to the dot what's in the law. So um, the laws do not conform to uh, constitutional standards under Article 29. Uh, under, uh, that's freedom of expression. They don't conform to Article 41 that speaks to um, access to information and international standards on broadcasting and free speech. So uh, when we look at the acceptable limitations, we have what we call a three-part test. And under the three-part test, we, uh, the first leg of that test is the law that limits expression. All the media must be provided under the law. So it's not enough for it to be in the Act, mm. but it has to be very precise and understandable, the media, you must foresee um, the consequences of your action. So, for example, um, would you know when UCC would come for you uh, for flouting the, um, the provisions of the minimum broadcasting standard? You would not know until it happens. Exactly, until it happens. So that clarity makes it uh, not meet the first leg of the three-part test that's provided by law. So. It may be in the law, but it doesn't meet the standard of, of the requisite law. So the second ambit of that uh, three-part test is it must serve a legitimate purpose. It's unclear what the minimum broadcasting standards serve because uh, in its application, we've seen that the state is using it mainly to stifle opposition voices and critical voices. So again, it's applied um, uh, selectively. selectively. So the third leg is, um, is it necessary in a democratic society? Freedom of expression is a cornerstone of, of a democracy. And if you stifle voices, you know, you're stifling democracy. So is it really necessary for UCC to come up with unclear, ambiguous, overzealous uh, provisions to, to guard the media? Well, talking about the breach of minimum broadcasting standards, in October 2019, and this, this is something I was a victim of, right? The <laughs> UCC phoned at least 12 media houses to be in grave breach of the minimum broadcasting standards following the broadcasts on Bobby Wine's procession and arrest. Now it appears that um, continuous broadcasts of exchanges between protesting crowds and security agencies and then police brutality, according to UCC, all this amounts to broadcasting content which, uh, with extremist or um, messages that promote violence, right? What are your thoughts, Doctor, on, on these findings uh, by UCC and how should the media respond as they move to cover campaigns in the upcoming elections? Because we know that elections will move with violence according to the past year in Uganda. All elections have been marred with violence and other irregularities, so you cannot separate the two. And even civil society groups have already predicted that there will be violence in the elections in 2021. So then how should media respond to such as they cover such campaigns? Thank you, uh, Canary. First of all, I want to say that we, I, I listened to Cathy, and, and I must say that we've had a fundamental challenge since we liberalized media in this country. We, in 1993, we just liberalized uh, the media, and there was no law that could actually define what the media could do and not do. Mm. And so there was this exponential growth of the media in the absence of a law, and that's why the Press and Journalists Act came in 1995 to try and actually retrospectively address some of the perceived challenges of this perceived misbehavior of the press at the time. And, and that's where now you, you find that they were trying to create standards to say, okay, somebody should be educated, at least in journalism, should understand the basic tenets of journalism, should, based on what had been happening as soon as the media was liberalized. Now, the challenge is that uh, a liberalized media and that kind of growth requires some sort of regulation. Our biggest problem has been understanding what that regulation must actually be. Uh, I think for the government, they have adopted this understanding of regulation that is actually control, that somehow you must be constantly checking what the misbehavior of the media is, 
and, um, and deal with them and punish them. But regulation in, in the real sense of regulation where uh, the economy is open, where markets operate, is supposed to be some sort of enabler <laughs> that you create conditions that enable the industry to perform, to, to have some certain uh, standards to, to perform well, to make sure that there's professionalism. Yeah. And that means that government is also putting in some investment to ensure that that environment, minimum environment exists for not just people to own media, but for those who own it to be able to do a good job, but also to protect the public. And uh, you talk about justification. I think um, coming from where I, I, I stand, a bit of regulation is, is, is necessary, particularly for broadcasting, because unlike, unlike print, broadcasting has its own issues. If there was um, a, a riot in town and, and everybody, and it was being covered live on all television, the impact it has on society is much greater than if the news, if the media, the print, uh, covered the stories, went and sat down, wrote it out, and, and just put and, out a know, picture or two. <laughs> put out a picture or two. Yeah. The, the effect is spontaneous, and that means that you, you have to deal with that potential impact. But in, in most cases, and, and I interviewed somebody who um, was part of the 2010 uh, closure of, uh, I think, Simba and CBS and some other radio stations. Yeah. And um, we, we do not have a mechanism by which we can actually say that there is a cause and effect. You cannot, in, in many cases, say that because Bobby Wine was covered on television, then people rioted. That kind of cause effect is far-fetched. And yet government uh, tends to rely on it. They will tell you how Rwanda, somebody said things on radio, and the people killed themselves. But what are the processes that led to to let people to that point where somebody just needed to pinch them a little bit Spot. and say that go kill yourselves and, and they actually kill themselves. Most systems of oppression do not get built overnight. They get built over a long period of time, incrementally. <clears throat> and that means that if you have a stifled freedom of expression, you will not actually know that people are angry over this. You will not know that this is building up. You will not know that there is a, a point in which people are going to crack because you have put in place uh, things that prevent uh, freedom of expression. So in, in many ways, uh, there, I can say again, to run away from the direct answer, there, there's a bit of justification for having some regulation. My issue has always been uh, what constitutes that regulation. Where's what the is in the drawn? content mm. of that regulation? What is the intention of that regulation? And when I read many of the laws, and I, and I mean all of these laws have been the subject of one of my research, that I analyze each and every one of them, at least as they apply to the media. And you look at the intention of the, the law itself, the, the, the way in which it is applied, uh, and I can, I can tell you that many of the laws have not really been implemented, have not been enforced in the way that they were, you know, put out. And in the process, they, they have only been pulled out when somebody somewhere who has power has been annoyed. So if you annoy somebody who has power and they can... Then they invoke the law. Yes, then, then they will call that and quickly react. And so if it's a bobby wine somewhere that is causing embarrassment to somebody somewhere, they will act on it. But the media does so many, I, I mean, I, I, I watch the media in terms of the moral standards, in terms of what they are calling moral standards. And let's be clear, moral standards vary from culture to culture. So if you do not so define it... So they are not uniform. They are not. And, and so if country. you do not define it and leave it in the law as moral standard, uh, 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 a UCC director who comes from, let's say, central, might have a different understanding of what moral standards actually is. And then next time you get somebody from the East, they have an, a completely different understanding, interpretation of what moral standards are. So if we do not have those things clearly defined in the law, mm. what they mean, then we leave it open for people to abuse it when and, and, and how they want to. And that's a, that has been a part of our challenge. So we, we need to, uh, you asked how does the media need to respond. I think the media needs to respond by First of all, equipping itself and understanding what exactly does, uh, what, what specific boundaries does UCC and any other regulator actually have. Because for the most part, uh, you, the media, the practitioners in the media also don't know 
what constitute what is constituted in these laws. So they are pushed up and down, but they do not know what their own rights are within those laws. And UCC or any other regulator can overstep their boundaries without them questioning. And it's not just these uh, defined regulators overstepping their, their reach, but also those who are not even in the law. You have heard of RDCs in in rural areas actually policing journalists and you know defining who goes on a talk show and who doesn't Absolutely. they are not regulators and they shouldn't be regulating the media in any way but why do they get away with it because the the, the media houses in those contexts do not understand do not appreciate that these are not supposed to be our regulators we have regulators in the name of ucc when it comes to broadcast and in the name of media council when it comes to print and, and generally uh, journalists when it comes to registration and things like that. So the, the, the media needs to equip its staffing and to make sure that people understand what is there in regulation. The unfortunate bit is that um, the regulation of media is not just by uh, the laws that, <laughs> that pertain to the media itself. If you look just at UCC, you will be shocked that uh, you can actually be punished as a journalist because of the Anti-Terrorism Act, for instance, or because of uh, Public Order Management Act, for instance, because yeah. of anti-pornography law, for instance. So there are those that are not directly related to the media, but they have impact on whether the media can uh, be free or not. So those are areas where the media needs to educate itself to also push the boundaries on not just their own freedom as journalists and as of the media, but also general freedom of expression. There is no way freedom will thrive in an environment where uh, the, the larger democratic basic principles are not respected and the larger rule of law is not respected and the larger issues of uh, uh, of common decency in an election, for instance, uh, why should people abuse each other when they are, you know, selling their <coughs> ideas, when they are, there's no point absolutely. So if we do not push the boundaries and look beyond the freedom, beyond Article 29 that my friend likes, then we are not going to um, attain any basic common uh, principle of freedom of expression. All right, so one, one of the things that stifle voices of the people in any country is the shutdown of internet. And, you know, Uganda has been a victim of that in the last election. But in a recent study by Nicolas Opio, Jan and Karanja, it was found that countries that shut down internet during protest mobilization have no guarantee of success and that shutdowns are a chaos element that may accelerate uh, the agenda of the protesting groups. W what does the law say about internet shutdowns? Do we have any law in our constitution that actually says anything about the internet shutdown? Or the framers of the constitution did not foresee it? And can they be justified if they do actually exist? And can dissent die in darkness just like that? Yeah, I, I know my friend is a lawyer and she can have one or two things to say about that. But I have not, as Emily, come across any law that specifically okays the shutting down of the internet. I have not come across it. And um, but, but, but is there one that at least suggests that in circumstances like this, <laughs> it's justifiable for the internet to be we shut down? We have cyber laws in this country. <laughs> we have the, um, the Electronic uh, Signatures Act. We have the... A computer misuse act which has been largely used to you know uh, get people who have um, who have abused persons of say the president or any other uh, person we have the anti-pornography law all of those uh, I think there's also the electronic signatures act they are, they are, they they're all cyber they're, laws but they're not talking about shutting down of the internet? No, like, like I said, regulation is about defining what you should do and not do and, and, and punishing misbehavior where there exists any. And so I, I have read those laws. I do not, unless I'm not remembering, I do not see any aspect where they, they actually should, should shut down the internet simply because uh, some offensive communication is happening via social media or on the internet. And of course, let's not forget the social... Um, media tax. You know, you know, we tend to look at the strict laws, but there are yeah. those that are outside the, the main domain of the law that actually present more danger to the enjoyment of, say, the right of uh, somebody's access right to information. for access to, the, to information. One person so on, on the internet said that uh, uh, the social media tax, OTT, is 
similar to shutdown of the internet because, I mean, you've limited my right to access information. Catherine, have you found any law that is, that is saying anything about the shutdown of the internet? Um, I think when it comes to internet shutdowns, there's a balancing act of protecting freedom of expression and, and other rights that are supported by internet and um, the state's uh, regulation of, uh, say, public order and safety. Um, like she says, there's no clear-cut law that mandates or empowers the state to shut down the internet. Um, now the question would be, is Uganda's um, action in shutting down the internet, previously we've seen during elections, is it uh, in tandem with, um, with the laws? Is it, um, does it serve a legitimate purpose or uh, is it really necessary in a democratic dispensation? Um, my answer to that is there's no law that, yeah. that, uh, that empowers the state here to, to shut down the internet. And uh, we've seen, if you've read the reasons given by UCC, is because they anticipate chaos. Yeah. So, um, and that is called prior restraint or prior censorship. You can sue the government from uh, restraining your rights or mm. censoring your rights before you even speak. So when you shut down the internet, you're basically um, stopping people from communicating before they communicate. So there's, there's no offense that has been committed, but you anticipate that they will commit an offense. So that is wrong under the law. And the state should be put on notice that if they attempt to shut down the internet in 2020, um, they may uh, be taken to court and on grounds of prior restraint or prior censorship of mm -hmm. rights. However, um, in, in certain situations, a state of emergency is made, um, require the state to, to shut down the internet, but we've never um, in recent times had a state of emergency. At no, least not one has been declared exactly, yet. Exactly, and the country has never said anything um, that would lead Uganda, or that would threaten the existence of Uganda. Mm -hmm. So as for the states to say, you don't know, because Canary said this, there's a state of emergency, let's shut down the internet so that there's no anarchy. Mm. So um, I think um, UCC is just being overzealous and um, the, the communication companies should, um, should also stand their ground and stop switching off the internet because there's no law that backs that up. In Zimbabwe, there was a notice. So if you ask UCC, where's the notice or the directive for, shut, for shutting down the internet in 2016, you may not find it. Okay, so back to the study. Do, 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 does the shutdown of the internet um, accelerate the protest mobilization or just cut it down? Because according to this study, uh, the, the shutdowns of the internet are a chaos element. And that in one way can accelerate Yes, I, I do believe so, because right now our lives depend on the internet. Um, offline rights are accelerating online. So when you shut down my right to use mobile money or my right to communicate to my loved ones across the world, um, I'm, I'm going to find ways of walking to Canary and say what's happening. So before you know it, there will be a mass or a mob that is asking, that is working to each other and asking why and are we off the internet? And what can we do? And what can we do? So mm. that will really accelerate um, uh, remorse towards the state. Um, it will create issues where there were supposed to be no issues. So uh, we urge the state really not to, uh, to shut down the internet. The right to communicate is enshrined in our constitution, in Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And uh, the right to choose the medium of communication is also uh, pres sorry, prescribed by law. So if my communication is primarily on the internet, um, the government has a positive obligation to ensure that the internet is on so that it facilitates my rights uh, to use the internet. You know, banking is done online now. There's lots of things. I can buy medicine online. So if you shut down the internet, you are restricting uh, a band of rights, a band of human rights. So okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to add something small to that. You know, when if you have children and uh, they fear you, they don't want to. They know that you don't want to hear some things. It doesn't mean that they will not say those things to each other. <laughs> it only means Absolutely. that they will not say it in your presence. In your presence, yeah. yeah. So, so government has to also be aware that uh, there are many areas where uh, citizens will know that if I say this, 
I, I have to restrain myself from saying this because I could be punished. And, and people have talked about, I mean, I write a column that ordinarily is a, a, a basic, objective, balanced column. And people always tell me, but you're so brave to write like that. And, and I'm wondering, what am I supposed to write? I'm <laughs> writing very basic things. Mm. So, but because people now have a sense of thinking that uh, if, I, if I do this, they, they rather meet over their tea and talk what they talk. I, I was uh, observing one particular talk show as a, as a research thing for three months, and I would just go and sit in. And uh, during the show, it was a three-hour show. During the show, people say what they need to say. But after the show, actually, I got more insight. After the show, after the, the show, air. where now they, they've closed air, and, and we are now just interacting. That's when people really say the things that they want to say. So they've avoided saying the things they want to say online. But they're saying it right within the same space, but outside when they cannot be heard. So I, I, I think that um, it doesn't descend, as the title of that article said, descent does not necessarily die in darkness. It actually thrives, in my view. Mm. It actually thrives in darkness. When you close the areas, avenues for people to freely communicate, they will find other ways that are even darker to say the things that they need to say. All right, so Dr. Uganda still has criminal defamation and offensive communication offenses on the law books it still exist and they're still there and there are many. Are there legitimate limitations to freedom? Are they legitimate um, limitations to freedom of expression? Absolutely. Like I said, just the presence of that law being there, even if it is not being enforced, mm. even if you don't know people, if you are familiar with the content of the law and you don't know in, in real terms who has been punished by it, you will restrain yourself because you know that this law exists and it could be applied. I could have my bad day. It might be that every other person might skate over it, but on your day you will have your bad day. So how does censorship build up, internal censorship, private censorship? It builds up because of presence of laws like that. And uh, like I said earlier, there's a multiplicity of those laws. It's not just those uh, you're referring to, but a number of them that uh, potentially curtail, and they are not justifiable if you're asking the question of justification. They are not justifiable. Okay, and uh, briefly, what will it take, Catherine, what will it take for such laws to be repealed? Um, currently, actually, there's a wave in Africa to, to decriminalize defamation. Mm. So when uh, you look at the African court decision of 2014, uh, Konate versus uh, Burkina Faso, they stated that criminal defamation laws are an unjustifiable restriction to freedom of expression and the media. So they ordered uh, Burkina Faso to repeal its laws, and it did in 2015. So with that decision, we saw Kenya in 2015 decriminalizing defamation. Uh, we've seen Lesotho, Zimbabwe. Uh, we've seen other countries decriminalizing. So recently, I did file uh, with a colleague uh, a case challenging criminal defamation laws under our penal code in the East African court. And that case was finalized yesterday. We had a hearing uh, at the East African Court. And uh, we're basically saying criminal defamation um, laws are unjustifiable restrictions to freedom of expression. And you know, um, and they are violation to, to Uganda's obligations under the East African Treaty. So the obligation to you know, uh, have a democracy, a democratic, a democratic principles, a rule of law, transparency. So we hope that. Um, we get a positive decision out of the East African court so that uh, we can have criminal defamation expand from our law books. Interesting. Let me put this to you. In a comment by the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, ICNL, and other publications by Chapter 4 and other human rights groups, the UCC in November 2019, uh, rather, the, yeah, the regulations that were brought by UCC, present serious concerns on freedom of expression in creative arts. Artists have protested against the enforcement of such rules. You know the recent arrests by the Rizonto Comedy Group. Mm -hmm. I want us to focus on these three rules and regulations. And it is argued that stage plays and public entertainment rules contain broad and excessive powers to, uh, uh, to, to at some point also maybe promote violence. That's why the UCC argues. But my question to you, Doctor, is what are your thoughts on such regulations? And are they constitutional? I mean, what can UCC say about the arrest of the Rizonto Comedy Group? <laughs> what exactly did they breach, you know? Because they just posted their content on the internet. <laughs> okay, um, it's, it's a funny one. And 
I, I mean, I always wonder why uh, state institutions like the UCC come up with regulations without engaging the actors who are supposed to be regulated in the first place. And and uh, I come from a very normative uh, from a very normative place where you, you you feel that there are some things that are plain right and there are some things that are plain wrong. Yeah. And so uh, the creative arts are very they they have their space. They, they there is a, a way we look at them. Popular media in general is, is despised and looked at and looked at very badly. But I think that uh, we, we have to accept that regu some regulation is necessary, but how do you come up with that regulation and what constitutes that regulation is what is important. In this case, I think there was no justification for coming up. Some of the provisions are laughable, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Like you have to pay somebody from UCC to go and sit in your show. <laughs> you have to apply to be... I mean, it's just uh, not realistic. Yeah, apart from such, there are also other regulations on... Uh the, the, the on content in the films and prohibit certain content from being published and they also establish uh, disapproach uh, they s establish uh, penalties of non-compliance with the rules what do you recommend Catherine um, the f first of all we applaud the minister for suspending the implementation of those regulations that take place regulation but the question to the media who reported that the minister suspended those regulations is, um, have you seen a suspension letter from the minister? So if there's yes. no... So it's not official. If it's not official, then they're still in place. Mm -hmm. So we need communication, official so communication. So can we say that the disproportionate penalties still exist? Yes, and until we see that the minister has suspended them in writing because she has the powers uh, to, to enact those regulations. Or if parliament under the amendment of the UCA, the Uganda Communications Act, suspends them under... I think Article 16 of that law. Mm. But for now, the suspension was in the media. We don't mm. know if it's in existence. So you need to follow up to see or to find out whether it, it, it's, it's, it has been imp implemented. Okay, and, and lastly, unfortunately, we, our time is fast spent, but using one minute each, I want you to comment on the digital campaigns in the prevailing context and a recommendation on how Uganda can protect freedom of expression in the context of the upcoming elections. Beginning with you, Catherine. Um, one, uh, I think the state needs to desist from, from using laws that stifle freedom of expression. The state needs to embrace um, internet. You see, um, I think governments have realized that the internet, you cannot really regulate the internet. So what they're doing is control of people's um, expression on the internet. So we urge the state to actually promote the use of the internet, uh, to develop the use of the internet, and to provide internet access to all Ugandans so they can be able to deliberate um, issues that affect them on the internet with the government. Thank you. Doctor, yes, last I, I, I had uh, the, the good president <laughs> say that uh, even in America, elections are held on, online also. Yeah. But we, we don't have the infrastructure to do that here. And, and that means that uh, we have to be mindful of the fact that a large number of people are not going to have access to these digital campaigns and have a plan B for them. And I don't mean plan B in the, in the sense of Bessie's plan B. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, to think that we are going into an election, majority of our voters are illiterate, media access is a problem, owners of media are politicians in the ruling uh, government and, and outside of it. I think that digital campaigns, have, there has to be a hybrid of some sort where some conditions can be placed, but but people can still have access to their voters and send their messages. Otherwise, you disenfranchise almost everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Emily Kamfat Marakto. Uh, she's the head and senior lecturer, Department of Journalism and Media Studies, Uganda Christian University. Thanks for making time uh, for this panel. And also Catherine Anite, founding director, Freedom of Expression Hub, and member of the Advisory Council, International Center for not-for-profit law. She's also a member of the high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom. This has been the Freedom of Expression Summit 2020. And thanks for watching. And till next time, my name is Kanaram Gumei.